Hello and good evening, everyone. I am so excited for how we are about to spend our Wednesday evening, and I hope you are as well. I'm assuming if you're here, you are also very excited. Um, my name is Stephanie. I am with The Novel Neighbor. We are an independently owned and operated bookstore that's located in St. Louis, Missouri. I have been looking forward to this Wednesday for the longest time. Ever since we found out that we were going to get to host this incredible um, event, I have just been like, literally what better way to spend a Wednesday. So um, thank you so much for being here. And the book we are talking about this evening, Into Every Generation a Slayer is Born, How Buffy Staked Our Hearts Our Hearts by Evan Ross Katz. And I, uh, if you have not picked up your copy of this yet, you absolutely have to. Um, this is a must read for Buffy fans, as well as people, we were kind of talking about this in the background, um, as well as anybody who has experienced being deeply into a fandom. Um, and I think we'll get more into that later. So uh, please know that we have copies available. We do ship outside of St. Louis, so we can make sure that you are hooked up. Uh, but again, I am not the person that you are here to listen to this evening. So let's get straight to the stars of our show. Um, our first person this evening is Gabe Bergato, who is a writer and comedian based in Brooklyn. His work has appeared in Vogue, W Magazine, GQ, Bon Appetit, and more. He is known for his musings on Taco Bell and regularly posts Survivor memes. Um, follow him at Gay Bergato on Twitter. And I just feel the need to point out that in the background, there was discussion of Survivor being on tonight. So um, if you didn't know that, I hope you now know. Um, the star of our evening is um, author Evan Ross Katz, who is a writer, producer, sorry, writer, podcast host, and high-pitched loudmouth whose works have appeared in the pages of GQ, Harper's Bazaar, Interview Magazine, Oprah Magazine, Rolling Stone, Teen Vogue, Town & Country, and so much more. He is a fashion columnist at Paper Magazine, a contributor at The Cut, and host of the podcast Shut Up, Evan, and Drop Your Buffs. He is best known as the world's preeminent Sarah Michelle Geller historian and a diehard Buffy aficionado, according to Vogue, and for being blocked on Twitter by Kim Cattrall in 2017. Note, she has since unblocked him. So great for all of us. Um, he was selected as one of Fast Company's most creative people in business 2021. Evan, Gabe, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hi, thank you so much for having us. I'm so excited to be talking to you about your book, Evan. Yeah, Gabe, we haven't spoken in a long time, a few hours. <laughs> Is it possibly hours? I don't know. It's been, I feel like we've just been celebrating your book for the past week, and I'm so excited to be, like, talking, like, just more in a structured forum with you. Also, people tuning in to get, like, all the good tea that I got, like, as you were writing it. Um. So, I mean, again, congratulations. I'm, Thank like, you. still leaping through it. It's been... Like, I love it that it's, like, both, um, you know, a book and a weapon with a hardcover. So. <laughs> yeah. Buffy would be You were saying proud. earlier, yeah. Just, you can whack someone over the head with it. <laughs> um, so, I guess just starting off, um, you know, you have worked as a journalist and a writer in so many different capacities as a reporter and profiled so many amazing people. Um, I guess going into, like, writing this book, kind of what skills do you take from, like, that sort of background into bringing this, like, this piece, you know thing to life yeah I mean I feel like the skill set that I had to bring in the most was sort of like discerning what from an interview was worth using I mean you and I both interview people all the time and you know that like what maybe like 10 to 20 percent of what they say actually makes it into said piece but this book had like a structure to it in which it's like you might bring someone in for a little while and talk about them at length but then you might want to use a quote that they said about something else later on so it became a lot about organization was really key. And also sometimes someone would say something about somebody else and I'd have to make a note to then go to that person, read them the quote that someone said and have them potentially respond to it. But then that could get tricky, right? Because then it's like, maybe that person says something, well, she didn't tell you about this thing, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of it was just laying out who I was interviewing and trying to ask them all the same questions. Um, so that I knew that like, for instance, I was going to talk about Buffy and race, for instance. So I wanted to make sure I had every single person ask that question. Obviously some people had more in-depth answers, but so I would say like organization was key. And I, I think it was a little bit less creative than I would typically try to be in the sense of like, I didn't want to cater too many questions to my specific, you know, niche interests on the person. You know what I mean? It's like, 
with Emma Caulfield, it's like, yes, do I want to talk about Darkness Falls? Yes, you know, but we just don't have time. Charisma Carpenter, do I want to talk about Veronica Mars? Yes, we don't have time. So I think just organization. Amazing. As a Virgo, I love an org chart, you know, I love to like, have your ideas structured out. But even kind of going into, obviously you, you, you had the idea to make this book happen. In terms of the book title, there are so many fun quips that you could pull from the Buffy world. So what were like some of the other potential titles that you had in mind? And how did you come to look at the decision, the decision of, of this one? Okay, so LOL, the original title was just Into Every Generation. And I kid you not, there is a recent Buffy book that just came out called Into Every Generation, which is why we had to add the Into Every Generation of Slayer is Born because it's a little bit, it's not a pithy title that we went with. I'll say that much. Um, but um, originally on my draft, like my original proposal, it was called I Buffy because my original conceit was really tying in more of like my own relationship to the show which is not to say that it like didn't make it into the final draft, but I think what I realized was that I, Buffy, is like so specific. And I also felt like it was a little grand in sort of making it seem that like I equated myself with Buffy, which I do not. Um, in terms of like the other quips, there are so many to choose from. I think for me, it was just because the show, literally season one, episode one, starts with Giles' intro saying, into every generation, a slayer is born, blah, blah, blah. And it's repeated, what, all of season one? And then I think we lose it like midway through season two, kind of like how Sex and the City midway through season two was like, we're going to change up the format a bit. So for me, it was just like, hey, it started with this. Let's 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 replicate that and start with the exact same phrase. Amazing. Um. So hot question. Who has been, who was your favorite guest star on Buffy over the seven seasons? Oh, wow. Um, 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 well, John Ritter comes to mind immediately just because I think it's such a meaty role for him. But I love the Shane West cameo in season two with Go Fish. I love Jason Bear in season two with Lie to Me. Obviously, we can't not recognize Ashanti's work in season seven. I feel like, yeah, we would be remiss. Um, and then, oh, oh, and then Amy Adams in season five. Um, but there are some really great ones. I mean, a lot of the potential slayers went on to be like, you know, thems in their own right. And uh, yeah, but I think John Ritter, be just because it's uh, it's such a good role. Ted, come on, classic. Totally classic. And I am thankfully, I'm so thankful you brought up the potentials because lots of great guest stars, Justice for Elaine's character. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I guess um, you, you talked about the organization of handling all these different interviews and um, being able to sort out like, you know, what to work with, what to like rearrange into different chapters. I guess what was um, the interview that you were most surprised by um, while doing this research? Definitely Seth Green, um, who I did not have originally because sometimes, and Gabe, you know this well in this business, like you'll sort of some, you'll, you know, speak to an actor and they're interested in something and then you go to the PR and they curb you right away. I'm actually dealing with that right now with my podcast. So yes, it happens a lot. So Seth Green's people were sort of like, no, thank you. Um, he's got, you know, he's a very successful actor. He has a lot going on. Sarah Michelle then went to him and sort of convinced him to do it. And I thought that it was just going to be, you know, a talk about his character Oz. You know, he was only on the show for, you know, I think uh, maybe 30 episodes total. And he actually had a lot of insight into like the process of filming the show. He had really great memories of the show. And for me, as a super fan of the show, I was always so angered that he left the show in the middle of season four. We just lost Angel. We just lost Cordelia. And I just, I always just loved Oz. So it was fun getting to hear the real story as to why he didn't come back. And also I feel like he is the Buffy cast member who speaks about the show the least because he has such a robust body of work that when Seth Green is being interviewed, I think it's just a topic that doesn't come up regularly. And so I think it was fun to get him to sort of like rifle through his brain. Um, and then also he just loves Sarah Michelle Gellar. So like to be in conversation with someone else who loves her, who knows her so well is always, it's indulgent and it's fun. Yeah. I mean, you, you bring up um, Sarah, who, um, you know, is clearly right behind you right now, if you haven't noticed. Yeah. Um, but so you've interviewed her several times over the years. So I'm wondering just like, um, how has that relationship kind of changed? I know you, obviously she is like your go-to icon and it's been so fun to see your guys' like friendship um, blossom over social media. But I'd love to hear a little bit about you in terms of like how that dynamic has changed in terms of going from like someone who was a, a huge, huge fan 
being able to talk to her and then kind of diving into like really the meat of this book? It's a good question. It was weird. It's it's still to this day weird. Like she texted me on Monday night before the book launch, like wishing me good luck. And it's just like weird to think about, you know, this cardboard cutout behind me right now was purchased by my parents in 2000 and what's the 90s, 2002 um, for my bar mitzvah. So it's like, it's funny that like, I have a lot of memories that, you know, predate ever knowing her. And then to have this sort of strange relationship in which we text message, it's a funny thing. I, um, I would say that it definitely changed throughout the process in that I am biased, right? And, and I don't purport to not be, but like, I am a super fan of hers. In, the, in that sense, I am not an objective observer. And that's why I was really careful to try and be honest, as honest as possible in saying that like, you are not going to get like the, um, an oral history without some subjectivity from me. I'm also really protective of her. There are, I, I really, I think I went out of my way to make sure that like, you know, I talked about how I asked all the cast members the same questions. I really wanted to dig in that point about like, tell me your favorite memories of Sarah, you know, talk to me about sort of like any behavior you witnessed of her on set um, in an effort to sort of, you know, reshape the narrative. Cause at the time in the nineties, there were lots of headlines and rumors about her being really difficult on set. And obviously I wasn't there, so that could have been the case, but I wanted to, I felt like it wasn't in my gut. And so I wanted to try and, in that sense, use my like journalist brain to be like, you know what, let's, you know, interview everyone that was on the scene to find out. So I think that that, and then also just like um, knowing when to pry more with her because it's, it's a fraught topic for all the reasons that, you know, you know what I mean? And so there's certain things that I, I don't even know if she's worked through in her own mind. You know, I think we all have sort of traumas that, and some of us, you know, some of us will spend our li lifetimes working through them and some of us will never work through them. And so I really wanted to be sensitive, not just with her, but with anyone when it came to digging up these memories, especially when some of them are sort of fraught. So I just, there was just a lot of sensitivity needed, especially with with the women of this show um, and making sure that I, I wanted to ask the probing questions, but I always wanted to be respectful. Mm -hmm. Um, something we discussed earlier is about how during this like late 90s, early 2000s um, time period, the media wasn't always the kindest to um, young performers, especially young women performers. Um, a lot of like salacious and maybe like distorted headlines were out there and stories. So you had to kind of go back and find these like old school tabloids and like like archival uh, magazines about these um, about the um, about Sarah about the show. So tell me a little bit about that process. I'd love to hear about just how was it like sifting through these old magazines and like hitting up old libraries. Yeah, well, it was so nostalgic because a lot of my early memories of Sarah Michelle Gellar are in the now defunct BB and Bop magazines. Do you remember BB and Bop? I'm more. I was more of a Tiger Bop. I think, oh well. Like yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but like you, yeah. So I, I love like, that was my early memories of Sarah was seeing her in those magazines and oh my god, and they, they used to do like really dramatic photo shoots of like her sitting on the bottom of a stairwell. And so anyway, so immediately I like the nostalgia creeped in. It was a lot of going to physical libraries. I mean, you and I talked earlier. I would go to the New York Public Libraries in the East Village and Alphabet City when I was home in Pittsburgh. I went to the Carnegie Library there. A lot of actually, I would say, because a lot of this was done during COVID, especially in the early stages before things were back open, it was a lot of phone calls to libraries and having the librarians open up card catalogs. Um, and then uh, with the help of Rich Juzwiak, who's a journalist at Jezebel, he helps me sort of explore the Wayback Machine on the internet, which I was not super familiar with, which some of these articles from way back in the day were scanned at certain libraries and then put online. Um, but then some of them were like, you'd have to go in the Wayback Machine to try and find them. With, I'm not going to explain the Wayback Machine, but it's it's magic to me. But yeah, it was a lot of digging out those articles because a lot of what's written about Buffy now is, or excuse me, a lot of what's written about Buffy on the internet is in the last 10 years. And so it's reflective of the show, but it's with this context sometimes that it doesn't even recognize the fact that it's sort of writing from the perspective of 15 years later. And I wanted to know what people were saying about the show at the time. Um, you know, for instance, I think about like the famous episodes like Hush or the musical, and it's like, I wanted to know like, what was the review of Hush the morning after? 
you know? And this is before Twitter and stuff. So you didn't have like the online response, but I just wanted to get a sense of like what people were saying about Buffy then. And because it's 1997 to 2003, it, it was challenging, but that's the kind of challenge that like I found really invigorating. Yeah. Giles would be so proud, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess in terms of like the thematically how things have changed over the years, I guess like what are some of the lessons that you've kind of like revisited um, when it comes to the show and kind of have have more of a fondness for or things have kind of like shifted um, in terms of like current climate in terms of how we talk about gender, sexuality, race. Yeah, I'd love to hear about how some of those takeaways have shifted. Okay, well, for the positive, I would say the queerness of the show, which I, in my rewatch for the book, I actually continue to be so impressed by. I think that the development of not only Willow um, coming into her sexuality, I don't want to say coming to terms with, because I feel like that has like a implication that it's like something that's, I don't know, it's like very academic to me. But, um, and then also just like the development of her relationship with Tara. I just think it's like, it's very sweet it's done over time. There is an investment that you see both between the two of them and then you as an audience with them. And I think it's the reason why Tara's death impacted the fandom the way it did was because we'd grown to care about these characters so much. And I never felt like they treated them like the special queer characters. It was just like, here's Willow, here's Tara. They both happen to be queer and they happen to be in love. And I just really, I'm still impressed to this day about the way, the treatment of those characters. Then also you even look at like characters like, you know, in later seasons, Andrew, who although was not out at the time of the show is canonically queer. Um, and then Willow's girlfriend in season seven, Kennedy. Um, I just felt like it was a very queer show. Mm -hmm. And then also of course, Buffy sort of having that, you know, that parallel to being a queer person, having the secret, needing to come out to her mother. Things that didn't age well, uh, I mean, it was Buffy and race, I think is just so so jarring. So in addition to there being no cast members of color um, throughout the show's seven year run, you have an all white writer's room. Um, and you also have the way in which the show at times would recognize race, but then sort of sweep it under the rug. So I'm thinking about like, Mr. Trick's entrance in the show in season three. And he makes a comment about the Caucasian persuasion of Sunnydale. So that's what he calls it. And so there's a, you know, the show is recognizing the whiteness, but it's not doing anything about it. And I really uh, found the conversations I was able to have with the cast and the writers, particularly Amber Benson and Jane Espenson and Claire Kramer, really fruitful because I think it was something that they were keen to reflect on and just hadn't had the opportunity to. And so that was, I, I found that uh, heartening to know that it's something that the cast and creatives are thinking about now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved reading what, um, like what the parts where you were talking to Amber. She just seemed to like really have like this like really mindful sense of like how this show fit into the like culture then and how it now can be like taken in now and where she like how there could have been so many improvements back then totally and how, why they weren't done and whatnot um so in terms of also race you talked to sharon ferguson who um played the first slayer right yeah what was it like did you know from the onset that you wanted to interview her what was it like having those conversations in terms of the impact of her character in terms of like how it was essentially a character of, of black and stuff we've seen before in terms of the enslaved black women, African women. So yeah, I'd love to hear about just those conversations and, you know, and how they went down. Well, it's interesting because like, I knew as soon as the book was greenlit that I wanted, I wanted that interview so bad. I, I really wanted to interview all the Slayers because there are six Slayers on the show. Um, I was only able to get to three of them, but fortunately I got to Sharon and I got to Bianca Lawson because Bianca was the other interview. I was like, that was like really important to me. Um, but with Sharon, first of all, it was like so, it was such an honor because I feel like she has not been given the opportunity to speak about Buffy a lot and she should. And um, so I was really just her, how energized she was by the conversation was exciting because there were some cast members you speak to that are a little bit over it. And I don't take any offense to that. I think that they've just spent 
decades now talking about the show. And with Sharon, it was so fresh in her memory and she was so excited to be talking about Buffy that it in turn made me really excited to talk about it. And what's interesting, her perspective is fascinating. I mean, I, I wish I could have done like just, you know, a whole, like it included the whole interview with her because there was a lot to it. But what I took away from it was the lack of resentment. I almost feel like I held on to more resentment about the treatment of her character. You know, you and I spoke earlier. It's like her character is not afforded the chance to speak when she first appears on the show. Tara speaks through her, a decision that kind of makes no sense at all. But she wasn't resentful. And in fact, she kind of left me by telling me that like she is standing by at her phone ready for the phone call about a reboot or ready for a spinoff for Sinea. Like it's, there's not a bitterness that she has about it. Instead, it's sort of just like she recognizes the importance of the character and just hopes to do more with it. So I was really inspired by her and I'm kind of like, give us more Sinea. You know, we don't need a Buffy reboot. We need a Sinea sort of like origin story or where is she now? So I feel like um, there's been so many rumors over the years in terms of where storylines could have gone. Or I think there was like originally one that like um, they wanted Amber back to play the first in season seven. Yes. So, um, which I like love thinking about all those different like realities that could have happened. So what were, what was like maybe like one of those that you like um, dispelled or like you, or there was a whole other theory that you found out while talking to writers? Was there anything that in terms of the narrative of the show or plot that you like were really amazed by? Well, that's so interesting. I think about that all the time too, like all the time. Um, especially I always think about had Oz stayed and how if they could have built out Oz's character independently of Willow. So if Willow would have continued on with Tara and if, Oz, and you know, as you, as you'll read in the book, it's like uh, uh, Seth Green was willing to stay on the show. It was because of the network being unwilling to allow him to be a recurring character that he had to go. But to answer your question, um, definitely. So there's, you sort of alluded to this. It, it's Amber Benson, was a, there was one plan to have her come back as the first, but there was another plan late in season seven to have her come back. Buffy was going to be granted some sort of wish as a result of, you know, God knows what. She was going to get a wish and she it was going to be the end of the episode and she was going to say, oh, um, I just got these fabulous shoes. And Willow walks in and she's like, check out, you know, I got these shoes. And Willow's like, you got one wish and you wished for shoes. And then Buffy was going to step aside and behind her, Tara was going to appear and Tara was going to be back. And it was because Amber Benson just felt a certain kind of way about her, both her experience on the show, um, having some issues with the production, and then also feeling like the character was mistreated. And she was, had some sensitivity about feeling like she didn't want to do the fans wrong. She felt like the writers had done the fans wrong, but she didn't want to be a part of that. So she opted not to have Tara return, but it left me so curious that it's like, what would have happened if we would have gotten Tara back? What would that have done for Willow's relationship with Kennedy? Because I never kind of felt like Willow and Kennedy made a lot of sense. I also felt like there was a weird sort of like age thing of like Willow's kind of like, the adult in the room and I, I don't know how old Kennedy was but she was sort of like this like in training slayer so the dynamic felt a little like teacher student um so I would have been really curious for Tara to come back and I also would have been curious for the fan response because so many of us like remain so enraged by the treatment of the character and I'm wondering how we would have reconciled if the sh how, what, what we would have done if the show itself reconciled it and brought her back Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when you bring up um, Seth Green and Oz, I'm like, oh, if like he had been built out, would there like have been more werewolves in town eventually as like the yeah, antagonist? Yes. So many different ways. Um, in terms of the seven seasons, what has been kind of your favorite supernatural being or plot or metaphor? Obviously, this show started off as a great, um, you know, um, conduit for like high high school is literally hell. That's like kind of like the the um, ongoing kind of saying. But what has been kind of one of your favorite sort of uses of the supernatural to like bring to life one of these like life lessons? Mm, that's so interesting. I really kind of like the early episodes in season one. Um, I'm thinking about, for instance, it's like not one of my favorite episodes, but like the praying mantis in season one, episode four, teacher's pet. 
is like an example of like, I liked how simple the metaphor was, right? And it's like, we get a lot of that on today's television landscape, but it's kind of just like, hey, you have a crush on the substitute teacher and it turns out she's a, a man eater and literally a man eater. Or I'm thinking about like the pack in season six too, where it's just like, you know, men are like uh, hyenas and it's like, oh no, 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 they're literally hyenas. Um, although there was one, two female hyenas. So maybe just... People are hyenas. Um, but so I sort of like those metaphors a lot. Or classically, I know you and I love Clea Duvall, the Invisible Girl, Invisible Girl, season one, episode 11, Out of Mind, Out of Sight. Um, I So I sort of like those early entries. Oh, and then, sorry, one other one's coming to mind. Um, Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, season three, episode four, I want to okay. say. Um, when you sort of have like the maniac boyfriend who's obsessed with his girlfriend to the point where he goes absolutely crazy and starts attacking everybody. I love it. Also, just while we're talking about it, a very underrated episode of the show. Yes. Well, let's talk about underrated episodes. What are your other underrated episodes? You know, obviously people talk about the body. People talk about what's more my feeling. What are your favorite? Like if you are rewatching for the first time and you're not doing it in order, what should you go back and watch? Okay, can I just say, though, because you bring it up, it's kind of like, I'm so sick of talking about Once More With Feeling, Hush, The Body, just because it's like, you can never get any interesting list of best Buffy episodes because there are, like, so many that you have to include that you end up sort of just getting the same list over and over. You know what I mean? It's like, surprise, innocence, graduation day, hush, Once More With Feeling, The Body, restless. So I love that question, but I also wish people's approach to this question moving forward, it's like, let's recognize the fact that, like, yes, the great episodes are the great episodes. Give me more. Okay, so with that in mind, obviously Faith's return in season four, the two-parter, is by far my favorite episode of Buffy. Faith is my favorite character by a long shot. And I also think that in addition to Eliza Dushku being so um, such an amazing actress and amazing in the role of Faith, I think that Eliza sort of electrified the whole cast in a way that I just feel like everyone was better when Eliza Dushku was on the show. So Faith, season four, and then other underrated. What's coming to mind for me is um, season three, Enemies, um, when uh, Angel and Buffy sort of pretend that they go along with Faith's plan in order to get information from Faith and Buffy's chained up against the wall and she says, can I say something? And then she undoes herself and she says, psych. That is just one of my absolute favorite moments on the show. Um, but wait, tell me yours. What are your underrated? I'm, I think this is maybe getting more properly rated now, but um, I love season seven's um, Selfless when um, Anya kills a whole frat house and then her and Buffy finally show down. There's like the... Oh. Um, the bit that they built out in season three where like Xander oh. lied about Willow saying kick his ass. Like finally the, re the truth is revealed. Oh, good. Yeah. And, um, I love that. I love um, season six, um, older and farther away when it's, so um, they're stuck in the house. Um, Hal Freck and like an underrated Buffy legend, in my opinion. Do you ever wonder in Older and Far Away, do you know when the boyfriend, when, when Xander and Anya bring that guy over and they're like trying to introduce him to Buffy? And it's like, I always wonder like that actor that came in, it's like, they were like, hey, you're going to play like a potential love interest for Buffy. But then it's like, oh, but she's effing Spike. And so you're going to go away and never be referred to ever again. Kind of like Jesse. Stabbed. Yeah, but like, that's like it. <laughs> Yeah. And then one other underrated, I mean, we're just in terms of like great episodes. I can't say too much about it because my boyfriend is currently watching this and we have not, I don't want to spoil anything for him, but the ending of season six, those final four episodes of season six, I just think like the way the show builds the momentum around everything that happens, hopefully people watching know what I'm referring to. Um, that ending of season six for, for what I feel is an incredibly lackluster season. I feel like season six really amps it up at the end. Yeah, and I love that we're we're finally giving Emma Caulfield like special effects again. Hello, um, hello. <laughs> um, it's so funny you bring up that random guy that um that um about to get set up with in for that birthday episode. Um, because I know that you were really um you really loved your interview with uh Mark um with Mark Lucas who um and so tell me a little bit about that and kind of like. You know, was he like someone that you added to like the list of interviews like later on, and then it worked out where like it was just such an illuminating conversation. Just I would love to hear a little bit more of that. Well, I was always fascinated by like how little Mark Lucas affiliated affiliated himself with the show after the fact. He 
and and I learned this during our interview, but he purposefully did not want to be a part of anything Buffy related. And so he was, he said yes from the outset for the interview. And I was, I had a lot of questions for him, you know, like with some of these actors, even though I was excited to talk with them, I didn't necessarily have like things to unearth with them. Cause you know, they've done a lot of interviews. Whereas with Mark Lucas, I just was like, I wanted to like get inside that head of his and find out like, how are you feeling then? And how do you feel about it now? And he has really disassociated himself with Buffy for his own mental health, which I applaud him for, because I think many people don't have the wherewithal to know, hey, this thing that I am a part of has a toxic fandom that I don't want to be a part of. I'm not saying all Buffy fans are toxic, but there's a toxicity around his character that I think made it difficult for him in the sense that the hatred for his character, I think, I'm not an actor, but I imagine if you play a role and everyone hates the role, you might sort of internalize that to mean like, oh, people don't like me, right? And also this was one of his very first roles and by far his biggest role. So I think that hindsight's 2020, but it's like his big break, if you will, and, and the fandom hates you, that must be hard. It was just really fascinating hearing his perspective, hearing about how he wasn't invited to the 20th anniversary that Entertainment Weekly did, despite the fact that he was a full cast member for one and a half, or I guess a full season. If you, I mean, he came in at season four, episode one, left in season five, episode 10, became a cast member season four, episode 10. So he was a cast member for exactly one season, but played a really significant role on the show. But I think that when you get bookended by... Angel and Spike, you know, you're going to get lost in the mix. And so I really valued getting to hear from him. And like, he was just like funny. Like I, at the end of the interview, I was like, I encouraged him to post more on Instagram. Cause I was like, we want to see you. He is very good looking as most people know. And he remains very good looking. I was uh, uh, glad to, to see it. <laughs> and I was like, you should post more on Instagram. Anyway, he was like, no, he was like, I don't want to. He was like, I value my privacy. He's not interested in the Hollywood life. He's not interested in acting to him as a job. And he came off to me as an incredibly uh, family oriented man. And I just was like, he was one of the most normal, and I, I'm not, I hate the word normal, but he just seemed like someone who really had a, had built up a strong fortitude over the years. And I came away with it with a tremendous amount of respect for him, but also a feeling like, he Who Must Not Be Named, the creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, did a huge disservice to Mark Lucas as an actor. And I am hugely of the mindset of Justice for Riley. Um, maybe I'm going to have to go back and watch season four, you know? Yeah, I mean, underdeveloped character, but like by no fault of Mark Lucas's. And still, the whole concept of Buffy and Riley being stuck in a frat house and tantric sex and being able to leave is like, so funny. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I also enjoyed knowing, though, that, like, he had such great things to say about Sarah Michelle Gellar and sort of, like, the ways in which she, because obviously she was a veteran at that point. Not only was it four seasons into Buffy, but she'd been acting since she was five. She was really helpful to him as a young actor on set and making him feel comfortable and, you know, helping to make him feel like he had a place there. He had a purpose. And so I like that. But, yeah, he was fascinating. I'm... Um, and I guess um, in terms of obviously bringing up Sarah has had such a long career. And so as you had conversations with her um, about the show, like, I guess, like, how did you kind of like negotiate the fact that she plays this character who like has all these super abilities is just generally like has a very strong character in terms of her values and her interests. Meanwhile, Sarah Michelle Gellar is like the screen queen of like, of slasher films, you know, is in, and we did last summer, one of the most iconic kind of deaths of stumbling through like a, an, an alleyway. So I guess like, did you ever have conversations about like the fact that she was playing this duality of like, like the damsel in distress and then like the damsel that like owns the distress, I guess? It's fascinating, isn't it? Um, Like it really like just, and also even if you add cruel intentions into the mix, like all of the roles she was taking during Buffy or even if you add Scooby-Doo in too, but Scooby-Doo has more of a par parallel with I Know What You Did Last Summer in Scream 2 as far as the damsel in distress. Although Daphne then she like- the rest of his butt, like, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, yeah but no, uh, I, yes, it was, it was super interesting. I mean, there's a lot, obviously, I mentioned earlier how like there were certain conversations I wanted to have with actors that couldn't go in this book. 
and I didn't ask them. With Sarah, I did ask them. So with Sarah, it was just like a matter of, I obviously wanted to talk about, I know what you did last summer. Obviously wanted to talk about Scream 2. Really wanted to talk about Sex in the City because she went and filmed an episode of Sex in the City during Buffy. I was able to include the Sex in the City bit because I felt like it was woven into sort of the discussion about Buffy. But yeah, it was really fascinating thinking about how not purposeful it was. You would think it was like, okay, I'm playing this butt kicker on television, I want my film work to sort of sort of show off my range, if you will. But it didn't seem like she was that um, methodical about it. I think that, I know what you did last summer happened at the same time. It was like really before Buffy had really taken off. And then Scream 2 was Wes Craven calling her and being like, come on down, I, I want you to have this role. Which, I mean, can you imagine getting a phone call from Wes Craven being like, hey, I need you to come in and just take, you know, this iconic five minute scene, Omega Beta Zeta, Although I will say they, I do feel like they, I wish they would have brought her back for five or I, I know she's dead in the show, in the movie, but that's an aside. But yeah, it was interesting hearing about that, but also knowing the fact that as much as it seems like she was giving us all of her range, um, I don't think she was thinking of it that way. I think she just was like wanting, taking the projects that appealed to her. But I will say I did see her two weeks ago in LA and I did say to her, we need a Sarah Michelle Gellar horror movie in the 2020s you know mm -hmm. i feel like the grudge we got the grudge in 2004 i don't really recognize the sequel i don't know if she does either um but i feel like we need her back in her scream queen roots absolutely um and then you have always been so attuned to like what's happening in the fashion world like have such a good eye for like you know the history of style and you know you, so, you start off kind of as more so like style and fashion reporter in, in your, some of your older gigs so um i'd love to hear a little bit about just buffy's impact in terms of fashion in television and especially like the, the teen genre i mean obviously you know there's a lot of buzzy teen um shows right now that are aesthetically brilliant so I, i'm just like wondering like what do you think um they owe buffy <laughs> Interesting. So I do think it's so interesting too that Scream and Buffy the Vampire Slayer share a costume designer, which I think is like, is like once you know that it's like, yeah, of course they do. Um, and I wish they would have, Cynthia Bergstrom, they should have brought her back for Scream, the current Scream 5. It's like, anyway, that's an aside. Um, I think I was really fascinated by the impact that the show had in the sense that I felt like it was very inspired by what was going on in Southern California at the time, while also inspiring. It kind of had that great balance of uh, being reactive to what teens were dressing like, but also recognizing the fact that like they were on the WB, they could impact the way people were dressing. That was really interesting to me. And also just sort of the way that Cynthia Bergstrom had to grow her up on the show vis-a-vis -vis her style, right? Like you meet her, she's 16 years old. But the Buffy, it's like you think about those images of her in season seven giving the speeches inside the house to everyone. And it's like, she feels like she's aged. I know it's, it's seven years, but it's like you watch the character grow up. And a lot of that is in the performance of Sarah Michelle Gellar's, but a lot of that is in the costume design and also the hair and makeup as well. I really found it fascinating talking to people about the fashion. Also talking to people like, so Samantha McMillan, who's... Um, probably best known as uh, Elle Fanning Silas, is a huge Buffy fan. And so talking to real fashion experts about the way that the show resonated for them all this time, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, but the way it still inspires them today. And, and almost like wondering, it's like, I said to her, I was like, you need to do like an Elle Fanning, like give me a Buffy inspired look on Elle Fanning in 2022. But I really, I mean, I've always been a big admirer of the costumes on Buffy. Um, I mean, the red leather pants, graduation day, part one, I was mm -hmm. part two, um, remain incredibly important to me. And I also was like, how many, you know, Buffy has been talked about from so many angles, but you don't get a lot of discussion. I actually gave thanks to you. We got the Vogue piece about Buffy and fashion several years ago. And there are some great style Instagram accounts that are devoted to Buffy style. But like, that's one aspect of the show that like doesn't get picked apart as much. Um, and also Cynthia Bergstrom doesn't get her flowers. You know, I feel like this show, it's like everyone's praising the creator right and left. And I, and I understand that, but like, I really wanted to celebrate other people and she was one that I was like let's have a long form conversation about the enduring impact of those costumes also I wanted to make sure the red Prada dress that Glory wears in her entrance in season five I was like let's let's go long about that like I was like there were certain looks I was like I really wanted to break down uh the homecoming dresses in season three you know there's just so many great ones 
Do we know if when um, Glory turns into Ben and he's wearing the dress, is it the same exact dress? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to speculate not because I don't feel like Prada would make something that would have the... For his broad shoulders. Yeah. yeah. Just wondering. That's a good question. Um, I know on the case, gotta have some. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess my in terms of this book, what was like your biggest win? Like, what was your the, the thing that you were happiest about when it came to like pulling this book off and making it happen? And when you finally mm -hmm. had the final draft done and everything. Um, probably Stacey Abrams because I mean, for all the obvious reasons, but also sometimes you have like a Stacey Abrams type, like someone in the political space or someone like really influential that will come out and, and affiliate themselves with something in the pop culture space. You know what I mean? Like you've seen like presidential candidates do it before where they're like, they'll mention that like, you know, Obama will be like, oh, I love Drake's mixtape or something. And you never know if they're sort of like doing it because they really love it or they're doing it because it gives them credibility. And in the case of Stacey Abrams, I'd heard her speak about Buffy because she'd done so in several instances but I didn't realize her depth of knowledge is like, it's just like you and I, like she knows the show in the same way that we can, you know, say, oh, you know, Enemies, season three, episode 17. Like she has that same sort of encyclopedic knowledge about the show. Also Cynthia Arrivo, same thing. Mm -hmm. So the idea of getting to be in conversation with people who I really admire, but who also are like on the level was really exciting because then in contrast, you get people like Lee Pace, whom I love, if, if you know anything about me, but who had seen one episode of Buffy and who graciously gave me this interview. But like, we really spent our time talking about Sarah, whereas in contrast with Cynthia and Claire Saffitz as well, that was another one. But like, you're able to have these real in-depth conversations about Buffy. And that was like really exciting to hear Stacey Abrams talking about, you know, beyond just the body and once more the feeling, you know, those sort of like surface conversations that we have about Buffy getting to A, be in conversation with Stacey Abrams to begin with, but then to be like, let's talk about this thing that we love. And for instance, to have her referencing Ted, you know, the season mm -hmm. two episode Ted with John Ritter, it's like, yes, Stacey Abrams, like, let's talk about Ted, you know? Yes, the deep cuts, let's do it. The deep cuts, exactly. Um, Question, I mean, did you, was there a reason why you didn't introduce him as six foot five actor Lee Pace in the book? <laughs> I thought about that. I don't think I'd come up with um, that uh, uh, preamble to him until after the fact. But it's funny because when I I was just I was reading some excerpt from no I was listening to the audiobook and I heard me say his name and I I never say his name without saying six foot five actor Lee Pace and so it sounded askew to me. So um, in the reissue, I will correct. With, yeah, also, there's a typo. I think the book says Julie Roberts instead of Julia Roberts. That too will be corrected. Okay, we'll we'll be looking forward to those those tweaks. Um, I guess are we gonna hang out? Hello, Stephanie's back. I'm She's back. back. I'm back. Um, gosh, it's so sorry. I'm like collecting myself because you just made me laugh. So I'm like trying to get my uh, serious face back on. But y'all have been like. This has been so fun to listen to. I'm sure everyone who's watching completely agrees. Um, highlighting some stuff for you all that happened while you were in conversation. Um, I think the biggest highlight, um, well, several people also have survivor recording. So like we- <laughs> you Well, so I actually didn't ask Evan. I was like, of all the characters of the Scoobies, who would win Survivor? So, Oh my <laughs> God. Who would win Survivor of the Scoobies? Tara. Yeah, under the radar threat. Yeah, it's like, I feel like, well, it's like in the current iteration of the show, Tara. But it's also it's like, you look at Natalie with like in Samoa in season 19, and it's like, I feel like Tara could also, anyway, but yes, Tara. Tara's my <laughs> survivor. I'm excited to hear that the survivor. Stand. Also, wait, sorry, one other survivor thing though. If we were doing a reboot of Buffy, cast Courtney as Buffy. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that. That's great. <laughs> brilliant. Uh, <laughs> also, some love from Detective Bat 2024 for Faith being their favorite Slayer. So I don't know how you receive that. Um, and yes. lots of love for Faith, honestly. And then there was lots of love for Mark Lucas. Um, King. <laughs> lots of, I love seeing the comments come through that were, um, 
different people are commenting, Mark seems like a total sweetheart. I felt bad for him reading the book. He seems like he really beat himself up for his acting, um, was what someone said. Um, does that align with what you kind of understood, Evan? Is that how you felt? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I honestly, I don't think Mark Lucas spends a lot of time thinking about Buffy, whereas like, I think, it, I mean, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I think Nicholas Brendan will spend the rest of his life thinking about Buffy. Um, and I think that Mark Lucas has more important things, like I mentioned, like his family or his other acting projects. And I think the way he views Buffy was that it was a catalyst to a career that he's gone on to have. But one thing he did mention was like, there's going to come a day when his daughters are of age and he will proudly show them Buffy the show, but it would more be about the larger show than it would be like, check out daddy's acting. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. Um, it's so funny that you brought up, um, this was very early in the interview. Um, I was going to ask if you've read or like what your thoughts and feelings are. Um, the fact that there's the YA into every generation, which like, just so funny um but there's lots that's of one word for it <laughs> i'm sure that's not how you felt um when that came across um but like how do you feel about like buffy spinoffs um like and however you want to take that like whether it's other conversations that are like books that are coming out that are kind of like trying to be in the canon um the Buffy animated series which one of our staff members brought up because they were like I didn't even know that that existed like they're a huge Buffy fan and they were like how did I miss that like did I they were very confused by that um slash also if you want to comment on the movie versus the tv series um any love, thoughts? <laughs> love 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 the movie I mean I think it's a very different I mean it's a different version of the show in so many senses and the character is completely different and the tone obviously is completely different but i do love it and i do think christy swanson is a very great buffy um christy swanson as a uh political mind in 2022 is not my favorite um but i do enjoy that performance and i love 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 luke perry so much i'm an american i love luke perry <laughs> um but to answer your question about spinoffs so there was ripper which was the giles spinoff that kind of got the most traction after the fact but I always really, really wanted the Faith spinoff. I thought that Eliza Dushku went on to do True Calling, I think like right after Buffy wrapped. And then there was Dollhouse a few years later. Um, but I had really wanted her to continue on with Buffy. I don't know if they could have kept the potential Slayers in, in the mix or what have you, but I felt like that performance and that character sort of deserved more. Or part of me wanted her to go over to Angel in season five, but then they sent Spike over instead. So I've always really wanted that. In terms of like the present day state of the show, so Sarah Michelle Gellar is, I don't think, I, I don't want to say she's in favor of a reboot. I think she's like fine with a reboot. And I asked her who her choice for Buffy would be. And she said Zendaya, um, which, hey, would love to see that. I think Zendaya's a little busy, but like if she can find time in her schedule, so be it. Um, but I'm more interested, like I said, I would love a Sharon Ferguson, Sinea origin story. I would love anything more, I mean, to me, it's like bring Kendra back from the dead. I mean, clearly you can bring people back. Buffy came back at the beginning of season six. So I would love something with Bianca Lawson. In fact, Bianca Lawson has not aged a day since Buffy. I actually think she's de-aged in many senses. So you could bring her back and set it in 1998 once more and no one would know any different. So I'd love that. Um, but I am not hankering for any kind of Buffy revival. I think the show existed when it existed i mean gabe actually said this gabe you said this in the book which is like that we talked about um you know how you feel about it now with everything that's come out and you were like it served a purpose at the time that it came out for you personally and i feel the exact same way where it's like i don't think you can recreate the alchemy of the show today and even the creator aside i just think it was it existed in that moment so perfectly um so if i so anytime i'm like Craving Buffy, um, I'll go back and watch the original. I'm, I'm just imagining uh, Bianca Lawson as um, the spinoff, just being. It starts off with her just getting off the floor of the library of season two. Like, oh my like, god! And it. then the nail marks in her neck just suddenly like evaporate. It's like I hate acrylics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
And then she goes off the radar. Yeah, lives her lives her Slayer fantasy. Oh, um, but yeah, <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> there's a comment coming through. Bianca Lawson is an actual vampire emoji question face emoji. Not no. <laughs> um, someone is wondering. Um, Ed Banger is wondering. Have either of you ever read any of the comics, either from season eight or the new ones like Boom or The Last Slayer? I have not, but Gabe, you have, right? I've dabbled a little bit, just like through what I saw on Tumblr. I will say, I, mean, I think Dawn and Xander get together. What? And, <laughs> yeah. And I think I think it makes sense in terms of like where the characters go because they like age up, but still that kind of, I, I don't know. It, someone please fact check me in the comments of like, I'm wrong. Um, and then I was like, ah, maybe I'm just gonna like let, like live and let go and just, you know, I love a lot of the fan art that I see of like the, the characters aged up, but I've always wanted to go back to the comics, but I don't know if like the rest of the medium for me right now. It's interesting though, because Dawn had a huge crush on Xander in season five and then they kind of like abandoned that plot pretty quickly. But like when she first came on the scene, she was like crushing hard on Xander. Also the one thing I do talk about comic book wise in the book is that in the comics today, the character of Buffy is bisexual and had a romance, I don't know what you want to call it, a tryst with a female slayer. <laughs> I also think, also in, um, in terms of Xander and Dawn, I will actually say that one of my favorite scenes from the entire series is from the end of Potential, when Xander gasses Dawn up when she isn't actually like the one who's supposed to be. And then there's the whole foreshadowing of the fact that he says that like, I see things and he loses his eye like two episodes later. So but bad. alas. Mm. Um, it sounds like you are correct, Gabe. Um, the fact checking is coming through that you are right. Xander and Don are married, and they have a kid named Joyce. Oh, they have, oh my god! <laughs> okay, <That's>, yeah. <laughs> I like had to fact check myself that I was the name was Joyce was correct. Um, but <laughs> so, so there you have it. Um, this is why I don't claim to be a Buffy historian. I'm a Sarah Michelle Geller historian. In that, like, there are much bigger Buffy fans out there that know the comics back to front and I, I do not claim to be the be all end all expert on Buffy. Justice for Joyce is what Billy says. Um, <laughs> hard left turn. Um, but in the book, um, one of the things that before I even like read the other stuff, I don't know if anyone else does this, but like, especially with like nonfiction books in this like area where you get like incredible photos I immediately turn and look through them like I can't wait till you get like halfway through I'm like I need to know what photos are in here I need to look at them now and then I like enjoying them the second time um was it incredibly difficult to pare down what photos were included did you have like a whole like vision board going on at some point and then you had to choose from what was that process like Oh man, no. Those were all of the photos that were out there. So Buffy the Vampire Slayer is owned by Disney, a company you might have heard of. And Disney holds on to their rights um, firmly. It's a firm grasp. So I was sent a booklet of probably 80 maybe photos of Buffy to choose from. Also costly to say the least. Um <laughs> A learning process. Um, but so there were about 80 and I had really specific, well, first of all, I will say the photo of Sarah Michelle Gellar from the episode Bewitched, Father Bewildered, that to me was like, if there's one photo included in this book, it has to be that. It's my favorite hair on the entire series. And there's a lot of great hair on the series. Um, but in terms of the other photos, yeah, I, I just, I had certain cast members I needed to show. So a lot of it was just like utility. And so um, you know, I got a few from like conventions, um, but like I, I wanted shots that had the most cast members in them, but no, I, if I had it my way, oh my God, I could have spent hours sort of like rifling through which still I want from which episode, you know, I would have included the Buffy with her hands up saying psych from enemies, but yeah, no, the selection was, I, I would say I chose about a third of what, what was out there. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. that's. Very interesting to know, although not surprising when you like remember who owns most of the things. But I just well, I was going to say, and also who's getting residuals from this show is also a fascinating conversation that did not make it into the book, but um, 
is interesting. I, I feel like we're going to have to get a reboot soon because they're going to want to hold on to the rights. <laughs> right. Oh, I honestly, it's like, I feel confident that we, we will get a reboot once the conversation around the show simmers. Um, and I'll be curious, curious. Um, this brings up a question of like, whatever you want to answer to this. But I think something that is, we've, we mostly, I can't use words. We ask every author this because it's very interesting to hear um, the array of answers. But is there anything that was edited out of the book that you still think about or like wish that you could talk about? And I don't know. I feel like particularly for you, there might be things that you wish you could talk about and you can't. So whatever you can answer, but. Well, we can talk about it. <laughs> um, yes. There was one thing that I, when you asked that question, I immediately think of that I took out because I didn't think it was fair to include without comment from the actor and I didn't I was too icky to me to talk to the actor about and that would be and you can google this if you're interested but there's so James Marsters uh was in or, or perhaps still is was in a band and he wrote a song that is believed to be about Michelle Trachtenberg and his lust for Michelle Trachtenberg. Michelle Trachtenberg was 15 years old when she joined Gabe's face right now. Michelle Trachtenberg was 15 years old when she joined Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And so there is, a, I think there's like a whole Reddit thread about this, but I had originally included that in the book. Um, but I just felt like to include it without follow-up conversation with James wasn't fair, but I also just like, I was not, it, just the whole thing made me so uncomfortable. And then when uh, Michelle Trachtenberg came out with her allegations against Joss, and then also the fact that I lost Michelle Trachtenberg for this book. I originally had her that I wouldn't be able to ask her about it. It just felt like I had nothing to legitimize the conversation in any way. And I found it really icky. Um, but that is out there. And I did not include that. That's very interesting to know. Um, <laughs> Gabe, do you need to comment on anything? I know I, we were both watching your face during that. I think my faces were just yeah. <laughs> the that news, you know? So <laughs> Um, okay, so before we wrap up for the evening, um, we always end with a little bit of this or that for any author interviews that we do. Obviously, for this one, we had to theme it to Buffy. Um, and so I'm going to give you two options. The only rule is like, you can't choose nothing. So you can reject both of my options and insert a third option, um, as long as there's like some kind of opinion. Um, and by rule, I mean, like, loose suggestion um obviously i have no real power over you um uh, so if you had to choose angel or spike uh angel gabe um angel and what? i feel like everyone answers spike <laughs> that's so fast i'm surprised that both of you agreed is there any i, I mean i don't really like i'm not someone who also watches a show for the love triangle i'll be honest <laughs> That, that, that. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Yeah, but also, it's just like, I can't move past the sexual assault in season six. And so I just think I will forever be hung up on that, where it's just like, I'm not going to support Buffy being in a relationship with her abuser. That's just me. Second that, and also, I think that Angel and Cordy shift, if you watched Angel, that was my, like, end game for them. But mm. obviously, it didn't work out. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Oz or Tara? Oh, um, <laughs> so definitely Tara, but I loved, I, I feel like, um, Willow needed to date both of them. They were both significant relationships, but Tara. Tara as well. But I will say that when I go back and rewatch the old seasons, like Oz's dialogue is sometimes the most like, I'm like, I did not catch that at all. Back no, then. he was so, and honestly, just like justice for Oz, there's not a character that has ever before or after replicated Oz. Like it's not an archetype. It does not exist. And I love that he was like cool, be, but not like your prototypical cool guy. And I just, I love Oz, especially season two Oz when he was cut, like, you know, with the nail polish and he would change his hair every episode. Oz was just the best. Dingo's in my baby. Hello. <laughs> Where's that album? <laughs> um, if you had to choose Slayer or Watcher. Oh, that's a good, interesting question. Watcher. I'm an interviewer. I'm a journalist. So it's like, I want to be the person that's like, I like to be like the, the, I don't want to be the lead. I want to be like the co-lead. So, or not the co-lead. I want to be the supporting. So yeah, Watcher. 
I'll be a vengeance demon. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Well, as Halper famous says, we prefer the term justice demon. Justice but... demon, yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, final this or that. Pre-dawn or post-dawn? Well, pre-dawn easily, but I think that I, I will say that I think that Dawn was the writers didn't know what to do with Dawn in season six and seven. I feel like they wrote a one season arc for the character and I don't think they were fully equipped to move forward with her. And I also feel like there was a lot of infantilizing of the character of Dawn by the writers because they really leaned into the young girlishness of her and didn't sort of give her the same trajectory that they gave to Buffy, who, mind you, Buffy was 16 when the show began and was saving the world and just making all of these like gargantuan decisions about life. And meanwhile, Dawn's just like, I'm going to Janice's house with my backpack. Can I sleep over at Janice's? And it's like, give Dawn something to do. So I just wish that they had made like a decision with Dawn that wasn't just sleep over at Janice's. Well, she was shoplifted. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. That, that was. I'm post on because I have a younger sister, Ooh. so I'm all for like that dynamic. But yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for answering those. P everyone watching, feel free to drop in the comments if you have any opinions as well. We love going back and reading those. Um, I just want to say before we end this evening, um, a thank you to everyone watching, but Gabe and Evan, thank you so much, Evan. I am sure that it was not easy um, putting this together, even though you love Buffy so much and love Sarah Michelle Geller. Um, I know that there was a lot that had to go in, as you mentioned, like at one point you had Michelle and didn't, and I'm sure there was so much back and forth. Um, this is such a fascinating book to read. Um, I've actually been like, so to get to people's hands of like, I don't care if you're not into Buffy, let's talk about fandoms. There's like a lot to be discussed in here and to take away um, that, uh, I think you don't have to have that prerequisite um, or if, if that makes any sense. So thank you so much. Is there any, are there any final comments that either of you wants to say before we sign off for the evening? Well, I would just add, cause the three of us were having this conversation before we got in here, speaking of fandom and you brought up JK Rowling as a great example. And so I, I do think one of the interesting things, and I get into it uh, with Tavi Gevinson a lot in this book and it's a conversation about Buffy, but it's a conversation that's so much bigger than Buffy. I think like any fan of Woody Allen's work has grappled with similar questions of like, what happens when a thing that you loved and discovered at a formative time in your life, when you find out more information about the people or person that made it, what do you do with that? And there's not an answer, right? There's not like a concrete answer. And so I really enjoyed getting to chat with both people involved with the show, but also people like Tavi, who is just a great thought leader and just person whose perspective I'm always deeply curious about, is that I think that those conversations, um, they have to do with Buffy, of course, but they're much bigger. And I think that they are unfortunately questions we will continue to grapple with as a society. Um, and also just the amount of, you know, thinking about what an auteur is in 2022 and, and, how much worth we give to an auteur is something I'm, I remain very fascinated by. Gabe, anything before we sign off? Um, just buy Evan's book. It's great. <laughs> what an amazing co <laughs> conversation partners. So wonderfully supportive. Um, again, thank you both so much. This was such a fun conversation um, to get to have. Uh, and to pair along with being able to read this book. Um, so feel incredibly fortunate. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in. And again, if you haven't, um, by some reason, purchased your copy, here's where you can purchase a copy from us and we are happy to ship it to you. Um, like I said, I think this book deserves to be in so many hands. And obviously it led to me doing a rewatch of Buffy. So really excited. <laughs> to pair that how could you not um and did for many of our people on staff as well so um good night everyone and thank you so much have a great rest of your wednesday wherever you are thank you everyone thank you gabe <laughs> thank you all. bye